who you know were saying that they'll be on and stuff. So we should have Excellent. a couple more popping on. Perfect. 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 Thank you. It says I'm the host now. You got it. No problem. Here we go. Now you guys all get to listen to me for two hours. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Could be worse. <laughs> yes. It, yes, it could. It definitely could. Where are we at time-wise? It is one o'clock. So I think we're going to, out of respect for your time, I would like to start right on time. Um, the first thing I would like to do is have everybody introduce themselves and tell me what office you're out of and what your background is. Let's hear it. Well, let's start with Nathan. Uh, I'm out of the Henrietta office. Uh, I'm a building substitute teacher over in uh, Spencerport School District. So I actually did my licensing probably like seven or eight months ago. And now I'm just freeing up some time where I could uh, take these classes kind of excited. Nice. nice. Um, more about my background. I have a background in uh, uh, truck parts, selling truck parts, um, also furniture, selling furniture, and then uh, obviously teaching as well. Wow. The yeah, guy. Uh, right. What are you going to do, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. You're going to find your passion. You know, you're always, you're always looking, you know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, it's cool to sell a couple houses, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Very good. For everybody who just jumped on, I am. We're just going through and introducing ourselves and telling me which offer office you're out of. So let's go to Laura next. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm in the West office. Um, I've been with Keller Williams for about a month now, and prior to this, I worked in sales. Um, my job prior to this, I was a staffing manager, but lost it due to COVID. So um, I just figured this was a perfect time to get into real estate. Perfect. Who are you? Welcome. Next, Dana. Let's hear from Dana. Um, so I'm Dana May, and uh, I'm with the uh, Brighton office. And I joined on May 4th, so it's only been a couple of weeks. So I'm just trying to jump in as many trainings and stuff as I can. Um, and I have a background in metalsmithing and jewelry design in silver and gold. And I have also managed a um, alternative medical practice for the last, I don't know, 15 years. So a little, you know, kind of customer service experience. Always have loved real estate, always thought about it and just decided better late than never. Well, it's never too late. Is that one of your pieces on your necklace right now? Yes. It's very attractive. I like that. Thank you. Talent. Very nice. Okay, let's jump over to Alicia. Hi, guys. Um, so I've been with Keller Williams for about three weeks. So just going through all the Ignite courses. Um, I'm currently in Nanny right now, as well as doing this. Uh, I graduated college last year, and I was actually going to be a flight attendant with Delta. And I went away for training and I was going to be moving to Boston and everything. And then while I was away for training, COVID hit and we all got sent home. So then I was just during quarantine, I was watching a lot of HGTV. And then I was like, you know, like that seems like that would be really fun. I think I'd be really good at that. So um, I have a customer service background as well. And I'm really excited to get started. Excellent. Well, welcome. In which office are you, Alicia? Brighton. Okay. All right. Very yeah. good. I met your brother yesterday for the first oh, time. Oh boy. Yep. <laughs> did he tell you that um, I'm older? Because he always seems to get that in. Yep. He did. He did. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He always has to get that little tidbit in. All right. Vicki Lynn, it looks like we are introducing ourselves. So let's hear from Vicki. Oh, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? There you are. Okay, I'm Vicki Brook. Um, what, what are we telling about ourselves? Um, what office you're in and what your background is. Okay, in Brighton, and my background is education. I was a uh, teacher for 18 years and then an administrator for another uh, eight years. And Ooh. I'm retired. And um, I love houses and I love selling. I have a business also where I block print clothing and do art shows. 
So since I have been out of art shows for a year, I thought I could do a different kind of selling now. Excellent. Okay. It looks like we have Nancy Rogers on, but she's muted. Nancy, are you there? Okay. We don't see Nancy. I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm just making my lunch. I thought I'd have lunch with you today, Karen. Oh, very good. It's good to, it's good to see your doggy's face, Nance. I know. I'll put my face up in a few minutes. Cool. So, um, Nancy, just tell people who you are, what office you are, and what your background is, and what you're doing. I am Nancy Rogers. I am in the Brighton office. I work on Team Hilbert. I've been with KW since I think it was December 15. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think it was 15. December 15. Um, I am a buyer's agent on the team, had my license for a couple of years. Prior to that, I came from a REMAX office, in a nutshell. Nancy's a rock star agent. She is a buyer's <laughs> agent. You. So she's on Team Hilbert, which is not me. That's Tiffany, uh, Tiffany's team. Um, I happen to be an individual agent. In regards to a buyer, um, buyer contract, it doesn't matter if you're an individual agent or a buyer's agent, it's still the same contract. FYI. So first and foremost, Alicia, you noticed, you made mention that you watch a lot of HGTV and that inspired you to be a realtor. I can tell you right now, it's nothing like that. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely gathered that it's nothing like that, but I still really love it. So it's what inspired me, but I've gotten that. Good for you. And I watch HGTV all the time and it's really great for ideas. And quite frankly, some of them, um, some of the shows are really good for talking to buyers and finding a language of real estate that makes you comfortable when you're talking with buyers. If you are good at asking questions, you are going to be great in this business because we're really a cons we really do consultations. We don't have to sell too much. I cannot make a buyer buy a house that they don't like. It's not going to matter. Once I see that little spark, then I know have to, how to I have to know how to consult with them. Part of this business is not just consulting. It is knowing how to Perfect your paperwork, number one, so you have a valid and legal contract. Number two, to get contract accepted. So I think um, these two classes, um, I teach, uh, Kaylee Moody teaches the buyer series, which means get the buyer ready for the purchase offer, meaning a buyer consultation. Um, and I teach the actual purchase offer, how to fill out contract. One thing that you do, I recommend that you do is pay attention to the emails from GRAR and from our office because oftentimes the forms change. So if you happen to have a file that you put all of your forms in and you make it a folder just so that the forms are easy to get a hold of, um, you really want to pay attention to those changes that the GRAR or our office will send out. Um, at any point in time, if you feel free to unmute yourselves, but at any point in time, speak up if you have questions, because I don't want you to lose that question and then forget to ask it. Is that fair? Okay. So the very first thing I'm going to do is share my screen and I'm going to pull up directions for a purchase offer. Is everybody able to see this? Yes, no? I can see it, yeah. Okay, good. So let's get right into this. We're calling it purchase offer boot camp because that's kind of what it feels like is a boot camp. Um, the very first thing that you're gonna do is make sure you have a pre-qualified buyer you should have that buyer consultation. Did everybody get to Kaylee's class about buyer's consultation in step one of buyer? Yes, no? No. Okay. It's all right. I'm sure it's been recorded and I, I would recommend you make a note to yourself that you do take a peek at that recording. It's usually about a two hour class. I know that's long, the nice parts about recording is you can always go back to it later if you can't finish it. 
in a nutshell, what Kaylee talked about was how to secure your buyer and how to know if you have a qualified buyer. How would you feel if you um, took a buyer out, you don't really know what they can afford, you don't know if they have any money, you show them houses for six months, you go to write an offer, they don't even have a job and they can't get a mortgage. Okay, if they don't have a job, if they're cash, do they have proof of funds? So a very important part of our business is to have that initial buyer consultation. My buyer consultations, um, it, so I got very lazy during COVID, so they turned into phone conversations, which finding out too that my buyers kind of like, I never got to see the reaction on their faces, never got to see how they were feeling about our conversation, meaning were they overwhelmed, were they in agreement, were they just going along with requests of this is what you do, blah, 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 blah. So that was kind of hard. I do recommend that you have in-person buyer consultations. What do you talk about during these consultations? The very first thing that I talk about is the process of purchasing a home. So the most important part of this process is to make sure the buyer has been pre-qualified for a mortgage. I, when I that initial referral or when I meet a buyer first time, the question I ask is where are you at in the buying process? Instead of coming right out and saying, you've been pre-qualified for a mortgage, everybody's going to be like, I'm good, I'm good. I know I can get a mortgage. I like to ask where they're, they're at in the buying process. And they often are very, very forthcoming. Example. I'm just starting, you are the first phone call I make. I don't even know where I'm at, that's fair. Second is I've been pre-qualified through a lender, um, so I know what I can afford. And I'm like, great, tell me about this lender. Who is this lender? Who have you spoken with? And let's say they say they've spoken with Quicken Loans. So, you know, that's when you kind of take the deep breath and say, okay, things are different with Quicken Loans or Rocket Mortgage because they are not local. The reason I say that is Quicken and Rocket and many other internet loans are across the nation. New York is not a title state. So what that means is New York closings are different. New York banking laws are different. In New York, we use personal attorneys to close transactions. There's only three states that do that. So what that means is we are not a title state. What a title state means is the abstract companies close the transaction. Your buyers and sellers never deal with an attorney. They deal only with the realtors and the abstract companies. So now I take a step back and I say, Okay, Quicken Loans, that's fine. Would you consider speaking with a local representative because New York laws with banking are different? And sometimes there's pushback and sometimes there isn't. It depends on the buyer in regards to how far I get into this because when there's pushback, obviously I haven't created my value and they don't quite trust me yet. Like why? she telling me I can't go to Quicken Loan, I can't go to Rocket Mortgage. It's not that I'm telling you you can't. I'm telling you that if you want to position yourself in the best light possible in this crazy competitive market we're in, you want to be competitive. So you want a local lender because listing agents, if you look at MLS printouts, they're going to say a qualification letter required with all offers. They want a local lender. And help it. That's what they want. All right. So part of this pre-qualification, so now they've said, okay, they're going to quick and loan. And I will state what type of mortgage have they offered you? Well, maybe a conventional or an FHA or a VA. If they don't know, I will ask them to provide a copy of that letter so I can digest it. I also ask them the question, have they gone through down payment and closing cost requirements, meaning total cash you're going to need for a house. 
No, they haven't done that. Hear my silence? So the loan officer has not been thorough. Whoever they spoke with has not been thorough. The buyer doesn't even know how much money they need. A lot of buyers just think they need a down payment. So let's throw an example out there. They're purchasing a $120,000 house or $100,000 house to make it easy. Maybe they're a conventional mortgage, 3,000 or 3% down, which is $3,000. Maybe the buyer thinks that's all the money they need. I can tell you for a $100,000 house, they're probably going to need 10, 11, maybe $12,000 because they have to pay a year's taxes up front and a year's homeowners up front. It's called escrow because that money is going to be put aside to pay the tax bills when the tax bills come to the buyer's bank. The other one, one monthly payment. Pardon me. Yeah, one thing. Um, I know it's either Quicken or or Rocket. One of them uses a standard like three thousand dollars for closing costs, which, to your point, is not nearly enough here. Right. And they do that across the board. So even though people may say, "Well, I know, I know what their my closing costs are going to be," or they estimated them, they're estimating way low because mm -hmm. our taxes are so crazy here. Right. Our property taxes are two, three, four times other areas, yep. oftentimes. So, you know, not only there's there's three parts to this money needed. Number one is down payment. Number two are, is escrows, which is your year's taxes, year's homeowner's insurance. Number three are closing costs to the bank. So on a $100,000 loan, average closing costs alone are $4,000. A hundred thousand dollar house, the, the property taxes are probably out. Charles, he's interrupt my brother's interrupting behind Lynn over there. Um, the property taxes are probably in the neighborhood of thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars. What we haven't even accounted for, also on top of the fees that the buyer needs, is the inspection fees or their personal attorney. So let's go back to that three thousand in down payment. Right? Um, 4,000 in bank closing costs, we're up to seven. Taxes of $3,000 a year, we're up to 1,000. Years homeowner's insurance, personal attorney fees, inspections, that can be another 1,500. So we're up to 11,500, a $100,000 house. It's your job to explain this to the buyer. Also, it's your job to say to the buyer, I want you to understand that the minute you put a purchase offer in, you have to go to the bank. The bank is going to verify immediately that you have that money there. You can't say, I'm going to save it over the next two months. If you're going to be getting a gift letter, the bank is going to ask for all type of verifications on that gift letter. Who's giving you the gift? What's the bank account number? Um, they have to verify, say mom and dad are giving a gift. Mom and dad have to sign a gift letter. They have to provide a bank account number. They have to show that they have the money in the bank. Then the bank will say, okay. So they really, really are diving deep into the pre-qualification of the buyer. There. At my consultation, I also... I go over the prequal. I go over inspections on the house. I explain to the buyers that they have the right to do a home inspection, a radon inspection, a chimney inspection, a pest inspection, whatever kind of inspection they want to do. I also ask them to research who they're going to use for an inspector and to research what is radon, what's involved in a chimney, because I do this purposely because when it comes time to write an offer, you're going to be asking the buyer some really tough questions, such as what price do you want to go in? How much do you want to put down? When are you going to have a mortgage buy? Who's, who are you going to um, go to the bank with? What bank are you going to go to? You're asking all these questions. Now, all of a sudden, you hit them with, do you want a home inspection? Who you, are you going to do radon? They're going to say, what's radon? Do you want a lead-based paint inspection? You have to ask these questions because they're all part of the purchase offer. This is the first time they've heard these words. If they start saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, 
next thing that's going to come out of their mouth is, I don't know if I should write an offer. And guess who you have to blame about that? You. Because you did not educate your buyer in regards to what this process looks like. Buyers have homework to do. They have to know who they're going to use for an inspector. They have to know who they're going to use for a personal attorney. They have to know who they're going to use for their bank. This is their homework. When I first meet with the buyer, I tell them this is their homework. And I'm going to touch base with them in two days to ask these same questions. Why would you spend your time going out with a buyer they, they didn't even know if they could get a mortgage, right? They don't need to, you know, sometimes they say, well, I don't know any inspectors. Can you recommend some? You must recommend three. Always walk around the office, go to your mentors who see who they recommend. If they haven't been pre-qualified for a mortgage. You must recommend three different lenders. If they haven't, um, they don't know inspectors, three different inspectors, three different attorneys. If they don't know what radon is, Google it. If they don't know what lead-based paint is, give them the lead-based paint booklet. Any home built before 1978 has lead-based paint. So they will have to sign an addendum to the purchase contract asking if they wish to do a lead-based paint risk assessment or not. I've been doing this 43 years. I've never once had anybody do a lead-based paint risk assessment. Don't ask me about it. What does it do? Lead-based paint is poisonous. It's dangerous. It's poisonous. The main concern with lead-based paint is don't ingest it. Don't sand an old painted floor without proper protection on your face, your eyes. You, know, you basically should be wearing a hazmat suit, for lack of a better word. Um, the stuff is very, very dangerous. What is involved in a lead-based paint risk assessment? I've only talked to one agent who's had it done. And basically, a company came out, and they dug into the molding and took a piece of wood and sent it to the lab. Three weeks later, it came back and it said there's lead-based paint. And it cost $750. <clears throat> I would have done that for $50, but and I'm not trying to make a joke out of it. But, you know, it is a concern to many people. So you need to bring that up to them. Karen, I have and a question. Sure. So when you're saying you have to recommend three of each vendor that you recommend, are you allowed to give your opinion on like pros and cons for each one like oh like this bank is really good with first-time home buyers or this one is really good with fha loans or whatever or are you supposed to stay like really neutral about it um i i give the knowledge that i know but in the form that it's not fact like i might say grb um, often has a lot of first-time home buyer programs mm -hmm. so that could be an, an avenue ESL, people might prefer because they do their banking there. They're more comfortable. Um, premium mortgage is a mortgage broker, so they farm out and look for the best rate and closing costs for you. That's about all I say because you need to be, you need to make friends with loan officers. So again, reach out, have coffee with some of our preferred vendors, pick somebody from GRB, pick someone from premium, pick someone from prime, pick someone from ESL. Make sure you have a good personality relationship with them. I actually have two loan reps from each company because everybody's different. Everybody has a different personality. So my loan reps, one is up here and one is down here. There's just extremes. Okay, great. Thank you. A lot of times I do also say to the buyers, ask their family and friends who they've used for an attorney with the understanding they need to choose a real estate attorney. You do not want an attorney who's doing criminal law and is tied up in trial and in court all day long. And with real estate getting as crazy as it is, the attorneys really need to be on their game about the new laws and everything that's going on with closings and delays, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you this, I was very thankful during COVID that the contracts I had in motion were, 
Every single contract was with a real estate attorney. Thankfully, because they immediately flipped to everything online. They, they did their surveys online. They did their abstracts online. They did their closings and they sent documents to buyers and sellers through AuthentiSign for signatures and verifications. I mean, they, within a week, real estate attorneys were back in business. I'm not saying there weren't delays because the abstract companies were delayed because they couldn't get anybody into the offices to run the abstracts. Survey companies were delayed because they weren't essential, couldn't go out. The listings were delayed because we couldn't get photographers in there. We couldn't go to houses. So we were listing houses like you and I are talking right now, except the sellers were walking through their house, showing us houses, showing us their house. How do you like that? And we'd sit there and be half dressed and half in our pajamas, working away. You just did what you had to do. So questions about that initial consultation and what you're asking of the buyer. Let's hear about questions. How many have purchased homes? How many of your agents sat and had this consultation with you? No? Do you feel this consultation would have been helpful? Yeah. So what are you doing? You're creating value, right? Also speak with the buyers about a buyer contract. I'm very frank with them. This is a commitment between you and I. I will work very, very diligently for you. I will give you my undivided attention. I need your loyalty and commitment back. I need to know that after six months of showing your homes, you're not going to wander into an open house because you're frustrated with me that we've written six offers and you haven't gotten anything. You think your chances are better by going through that agent, the open house. I need a commitment. I think, I think you need to use your judgment on this. I think you need to study the buyer's contract. Kaylee goes over this very thoroughly at that, that recording, their series part one. It's a wonderful way of presenting it. I tend to meet with my buyers and send the contract home with them because sometimes I don't know if the buyer and I are going to be a fit. Over the last, you know, 20 years that I've had a business, I've had two buyers where it's just like, I had to say, we are not a fit. This is just not going to work. I can refer you to someone else or you can, you know, choose an agent more. You think will do a better job. We just weren't a fit. And every time they called me to see a house, I was just like, oh, this is exactly what they said they didn't want. Why are we looking at this house? So... Sometimes it's just not a fit. So I ask the buyers to read the buyer consultate buyer contract. And then when I see them the next time, we'll make a decision if we're willing to commit to each other. You think that's fair? Right. It sounds fair. You know, it's kind of like a attorney that you get for a retainer. They're not paying you. It says they'll pay you if they go buy the house with someone else. I, I think it's only fair that you have that initial conversation. They look at it as more of a professional relationship as well. The worst, the, the hardest people to work with, I find, are friends and family. Because you kind of assume they know what you're doing. Meaning they know how the process works. They know you just assume that they're qualified. You just assume that, you know, Anytime they want to see a house, they're going to write, run right out. It's very hard to work sometimes with friends and family. The other side of that is who's going to do a better job for them? You. You're going to do the best job you can for friends and family. So we also discuss the process, the timing. Are they on a lease? Do they have to be in a property at a certain amount of time? Because quite frankly, from the date of purchase offer to closing is usually 45 to 60 days. So you need to do your timing accordingly. 
it is a standard purchase offer with somebody getting a mortgage, we usually allow 60 days. If it's a cash deal, I've seen them written for 30 days, but lately I haven't seen them close before 45 days because the attorneys are still waiting on the abstract in the surveys. I, when I talk to them about the process, I talk to them about when money is also due. Meaning, once you write an offer, you will put down a good faith deposit. That will be due within 48 hours of acceptance of contract. In the past, we would see $1,000, $2,000 good faith deposits. Now we're seeing five, ten, fifteen, twenty. I had a fifty-one thousand dollar good faith deposit last week. It was a it was a condition of their mortgage, so you need to prepare them for that. Next money that they're going to need is their mortgage application and appraisal fees. So you need to be in touch with their loan rep once you get a copy of that <laughs> call letter. Immediately pick up the phone and call the loan rep. Certain lenders have a little app they will send you so that every house you walk into, you can figure out what the mortgage payment will be. You can plug in the taxes, you can plug in the price, you can plug in the, um, if it's PMI insurance, you can plug in the homeowner's insurance. Plus it actually figures out their down payment, their closing costs and their escrows. VRB has this app, Premium Mortgage has this app I'm not aware if ESL has the app. One thing also, when you, let me just backtrack here, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this. When they are choosing a mortgage company, find out if it's a bank like Citizens Bank that's only open from nine until 4.30 and you can't talk to anybody on the weekend or evenings. Because that's huge can't tell you how many Saturday mornings I'm texting my loan rep and saying, I need information like right now. I can't wait for Citizens Bank to open at nine o'clock on Monday morning. Can't do it. So make sure your loan rep is an out of the office rep. You're going to find that ESL, there's, there's certain reps at ESL only work the, the 8.30 till 5 or whatever. Some of them are out of the office rep. We, when do we mostly work? When other people aren't working, right? So your loan rep has to be available to you. Not your attorney, not your inspector, just the loan rep. So we talk about the good faith when that's due. We talk about um, the application and appraisal fees when that's due. And then your buyer really doesn't need any money until closing. So we get all this done. We talk to, I also have a very strong conversation with my buyers about not going into new construction sites without me. And if they're going to an open house, let me know ahead of time so that I can register them in. Never ever that should they walk into an open house without signing me in as their agent. If your buyer wanders into a new construction site, you are not with them. You just lost your commission because those agents at that new construction site are working for the builder and you will not get paid. It's as simple as that. Now, if you have a buyer's agency contract signed, technically the buyer is still responsible to pay you. So even if they walk into new construction and that builder won't honor you, you need to make the buyer aware of the fact that guess what? You still have to pay me because you signed a contract. If you never tell them not to do that, how do you ask for your money if you haven't educated them? Everybody drives by the big flags. Oh, let me just wander into this model. I worked new construction. It was nothing worse. I was married to the subdivision every Saturday and Sunday from one to five. The last thing I wanted was to have somebody wander in, not talk about having a realtor. I spend days and weeks all of their documents together and they go, oh, by the way, I have a realtor. No, you don't. No, you don't. You have me. Because I've been the one working with you. Is that fair? Protecting your income, guys. That's what I'm doing right now. <clears throat> okay. Your buyer's ready. You're in that consultation. Always have this, and this is very important to do right off the bat. 
So what are you looking for? Where do you want to live? I want to live in Penfield. I want four bedrooms, two and a half baths, two car garage, an acre lot, and my budget is 150000 So I immediately put that criteria into the computer right when I'm sitting with them. What are the results? Zero. I said, okay, what are you willing to compromise on? We know that you only qualify for 150000 so let's just put it in Monroe County and see what's out there for 150000 and down. Is that a reality check for your buyer? Don't give them false hopes because you know what you're going to do? Work a very, very long time and have a very, very upset buyer. I have buyers who call me and say, my goodness, you haven't sent me any houses in a week. That is my perfect opportunity. Or I text them and say, notice that no houses are coming up this week. We need to compromise on some of your criteria. Be the proactive person. What are you willing to compromise on? Well, I guess I could deal with three bedrooms. Well, I guess I could look at different locations. Are you asking the question? If you don't, they're going to forget about you. You know how they say out of sight, out of mind? If you get a buyer or a potential seller, you need to be in touch with them frequently. No less than once a week. There. Now you set up the search. You can automatically set up a search for them in Matrix. When you set up the search, note to self, and copy yourself in on that search. Because someone will text me and say, oh my gosh, I want to see that house you sent me today. Oh boy, which house is that? So copy yourself in on the search. You'll get the same emails they do. Now you make appointments, you make appointments, you make appointments. There's a couple little things I want to bring up just because I've had some listings lately and I, for some reason, I don't know why agents can't lock doors or why agents feel like they can go up in someone's crawl space and get insulation all over their house or why, a, why an agent would unplug or a buyer would unplug someone's freezer just, or, or leave doors unlocked. Guess what? Listing agents know who is in the house just by the electronic lockbox. I know that if I go over to that house at eight o'clock at night, there was a showing at seven o'clock. I know the last person who was in that house. So when I find the sliding glass door wide open, I make a phone call and they say, oh, we didn't go out the sliding glass door. Did you not notice that it was left wide open? How would you like it if that was your house? Anybody have any to say about that what i'm saying is be respectful pay attention to what is written in the private remarks and in showing time when you're showing houses and instruct your buyers i always remind my buyers that somebody actually lives there because i think they're used to watching tv mm -hmm. and seeing houses that aren't lived in and they go on through a lot and a lot of people have have bought and moved out, but especially now it's, it's nice to remind them that somebody actually lives there. Yes. Okay. You, you need, I know you need to go through some things that you don't necessarily want people to go through. Um, you know, yes, you got to open the closets and blah, 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 but, but somebody lives there. Like they're going to come home tonight and they're going to sleep here. Right. And I sometimes have to have had to say it that way. Well, and, you know, people show up with their kids then they let the kids run through the house. Yeah. Oh, I said, stop right here. You guys, you got to hang on to the kids. They can't be wandering around the house. Well, they're excited. They can't help it. You have to, or I'll bring them. What can I say? I know I sound very harsh, but there's rules. There's rules. How would you like it if someone let some little two-year-olds run all over your house? You wouldn't like it. So be respectful when you're showing houses. That's the best thing I can say. Make sure you lock the doors. If you see something wrong in the house, call the listing agent immediately. I walked in one house out in Brockport. The first thing I heard was like water. 
and go down the basement steps in a pipe rope and water was just shooting across the floor. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I went down the steps a little further, looked for the water main just to shut it off and realized the water main was water. There was a good two feet of water in the, the basement. I immediately called the listing agent and I said, you've got a major problem here, a pipe burst. And there's about two feet of water in the basement. She's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I'm coming right over. So my buyer who went through the rest of the house and didn't like it left. And I waited for that agent because I didn't have any other appointments. And she goes, I'm just going to go down there and turn the paint off. I said, no, you're not. You know, there could be electric wires. So just, just do the right thing and make a phone call. I walked up and he had a storm door flapping and broken. It's broken. Called the listing agent and said, Is the storm door supposed to be broken? She said, No. You're being courteous. And plus, they know you didn't do it. Okay. We find the right house. Our job is, is really, really great because we if they have that app from their loan officer, you don't have to figure out what their mortgage payment is and what they would be looking at money down. And unfortunately, if we're following my list here, um, it says research the house, find the cops. Well, we don't know what houses are gonna sell for right now in this market, but it still is a good idea ahead of time to have some idea of value in the neighborhood. If the house is priced at 400 and the highest priced home sold in the neighborhood is 250, something's wrong, right? You know that. What I do check are the taxes. If I'm working in Monroe County, I go on the monroecounty.gov site or the Monroe County tax portal under our links tab on our dashboard. And you can just put the address in and the true taxes will come up. What the seller is paying and what the true taxes are could be two different amounts. So make sure that your buyers are looking at the correct taxes. It would be nothing better than you quote the taxes off the MLS printout and the, the listing agent made a mistake. And maybe the taxes are $1,200 more. They forgot to fill in a village tax or something. You need to be aware as if you're in a village, is there a village tax? If you don't know if you're in a village, look at surrounding homes. Exactly. Number four, research the house. If you see other properties that have sold on the same street, check the taxes. See if there's a village tax. Say the village tax is $1,200 a year. It's $100 a month more on your buyer's mortgage payment. If they don't know about it, they're going to be pretty upset with you. More upset if they don't qualify. They've gone through, written an offer, did a good faith deposit, their application, paid for an engineer inspection, and then found out they don't qualify. Who are they going to look at? You. Also take a look and see what is stated under realist, which is another function in our ML, in our matrix system. Take a picture, take a peek. There's a little box that says features. It's about three quarters of the way down on the page, on page usually to, sometimes it flips over to page three. It says features, and under features, you'll see what recent permits may have been taken out. Maybe for a deck or a shed or a pool. Because nowadays, agents are writing offers, not asking for permits, but it is kind of nice to know if they're on file. Some agents will ask for permits, and we'll go through that in the purchase offer. We are going... I'm just going to go through because this is procedure, but then you fill out the offer completely. Um, make sure you fill in the attorney's name. Make sure you fill in the admin page. Make sure you have all the forms that you need for that particular offer. It is an FHA offer. You need a special addendum. It's an FHA addendum. Make sure the property appraises out. You're going to know ahead of time you have an FHA buyer, right? So you go to your mentor and you say, what forms are different for FHA that I might need? Or if your buyer has a house to sell, you're going to need different forms. If the house has a well and septic, you're going to need a different form. If 
If the house is in Wayne County, you need a different form. So you need to educate yourself in regards to what forms are needed for each particular property. The nice part with Authenticide is most of the forms will be there. But when you go into Authenticide, you can scroll all the forms and just kind of think about what form might apply. We will be going through that today too. Not in depth, but we will be going through it. FYI, about 2.15, 2.30, you're gonna start looking like here with the headlights, right? It's a lot of information. Not unusual for people to take this class initially when you start, and when you start showing houses and maybe get ready to write a purchase offer, you'll end up taking or listening to the recording again, and once you write your first purchase offer, you'll be back here again. Because there's going to be things like, oh my goodness, I thought I knew that, but I don't. This is crash course. So you get your offer accepted, you do have, then there's the procedure of what you have to do. Is the buyer's responsibility to get that contract to both attorneys to, for approval? It's your responsibility to get the good faith deposit check to the listing office. Your responsibility to read the attorney's approvals when they come in. Make sure there's no counter offers in them. No terms have changed. Make sure the deposit check clears. Make sure the buyers get to the bank. Get their mortgage started. These are all your duties. If you have a home inspection, you need to get that inspection scheduled. You also need to attend the home inspection. And you're responsible to remove the contingencies. If the buyer asks for repairs, that's your responsibility. Write up that addendum. Along with documentation from the inspection, it states what's wrong with the house. They can't just say, oh, it needs, um, there's a leaky faucet, it needs a new faucet. You need that documented from the actual page of the inspection. Your mentor will go through all this, has everybody been assigned a mentor or some people are probably still too new? Who's been assigned a mentor? Okay, not quite yet. As soon as you're assigned a mentor, most mentors will ask you to practice. Don't practice on purchase offers. Don't take that lightly. Practice on those purchase offers because outside of being able to write your purchase offer for a for a client, you're going to be nervous. Oh, am I missing anything? Am I doing the right thing? What about the terms? Should I have an escalation clause? You're going to need your mentor for all that. You don't want your mentor to say, press this button, go here. You want to practice ahead of time. Fair? And an independent study. So now you're following up. You want to make sure two to three weeks later that the bank's appraiser has gone out you make sure that the appraiser on um, the house appraised for purchase price and there's no repairs. It is your job as a buyer's agent. And you kind of sit back again and you wait for the bank to issue what they call a clear to close. That means everything's in order and the attorneys can schedule a closing date. Up to the attorneys to schedule a date. I don't know how many times do you have to tell clients? I usually tell them about five times. And they still don't get it. Date on the contract for closing is a target date. They'll call me a month before closing and say, when am I closing? Don't schedule the date. The attorney does. It's a close. It's a target date. I need to schedule a mover. What should I do? Movers know that they're, they don't know a closing a month ahead of time. They will put you in pencil with flexibility. Right? I can probably say in all the years in business, I might have had 20 houses close on the date on the contract. Don't disappoint your buyers by saying this is the date. Hard to do. So now once you're issued a clear to close, the attorneys hopefully will include you in on correspondence to say that you now have a scheduled closing date is your responsibility to set up and do a final walkthrough with that buyer. You go through the house, make sure everything was as you saw it. If there are any problems, meaning there's a hole in the wall, take a picture of the hole, 
send that picture to the attorneys and tell your buyers to call their attorney and say, your attorney's got to get involved in this. Out of courtesy, I do call the listing agent and say, we have a problem. The walkthrough, there's a hole in the wall. I send them a picture, say, I have put this in the attorney's hands. I want to get involved because it's too close to closing. Um, I got to a walkthrough last week and none of the utilities were on. We couldn't do the walkthrough. Then it moved out. The landlord forgot to put the utilities in their name. So we had no utilities. Closing was delayed because we had to wait for the utility company to come back on and come back out and turn the utilities on. Also inform your buyer that um, they have to put utilities in their name or they will not have utilities. The seller most likely will turn the turn the utilities off as of closing date. Fair. All right, let's get into forms. Here we go. So this is just um, this next page is an example. I don't know why this page is here, but this is an example of what your realist tax report looks like. And I think this one might have it. Um, see where it says features here? Can you see that? That's an example of what I was talking about in regards to um, if there's any permits. So most likely they had the house was built in 1972. So when they built the house, it had the garage, it had a covered porch. Um, and in 1973, they added to the porch also put on a flagstone patio and in 1974 or not in 2004 got a pool now there's only so many lines on this you might go out there and there's a deck and a shed and everything else you know you can call the town but most of the towns don't give you the information over the phone you can ask the listing agent um sometimes listing agents will put a copy of those permits in the listing, oftentimes they don't. This is a, um, prop, a picture of a property condition disclosure statement. I just wanted to put this here because a, we call it a PCD. This is filled out by the sellers. You need to know that there are some exemptions to this. For example, you do not need a PCD. If it's a new house, it's a condo differing from a townhouse, for a townhouse, you need it. For a condo, you don't. If it's a commercial property, if it's a foreclosed property, it's a multifamily dwelling of five units or more. Or if it's vacant land, if it is transferred due to a court order, like in a state, there's nobody to fill out the property condition disclosure, so it's not required. Or if it's a HUD property, which is a foreclosure, you don't need a property condition disclosure. So let's say you're writing the offer and part of the offer says um, that your buyer has reviewed the, the PCD and finds it acceptable. If it's there, you check that box. If it's not applicable because of the circumstances Bob, that I just read to you, you check the box that says not applicable. There's another box that you can check that says PCD was not provided that the buyer will get a $500 credit at closing. Most listing agents freak out about that because they forgot to add the PCD and now the seller has to give a $500 credit. I make that courtesy phone call to the listing agent and say, hey, where's the PCD? Oh, shoot, I forgot to scan it in or I don't have it back yet. Well, I want to write an offer and you don't have it. So I don't want to ask for a credit. So I'm going to put in the offer that the seller is to provide it within 24 hours of acceptance of offer and it's to be satisfactory to the buyer. You can also do that with a lead-based paint addendum or the lead-based paint addendum. Under no circumstances ever, 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 you have a buyer sign a lead-based paint addendum is blank. That is a $10,000 fine. If we get audited and, and someone looks at the dates and the buyer signed it before the seller, we're going to come right back to the agent and say, what did you do? If the lead-based paint 
addendum is not there, you can put that same statement in the contract. I don't recommend it. Some agents feel if it's in a state, they don't need one. That's not true. Who signed the listing paper? Who signed the listing paperwork to put the house in the computer? Whoever signs the listing paperwork fills out the lead base paint addendum. You always need one if the house was built before 1978. So, and this is, sorry, this is a copy of the lead base or the property condition disclosure. Scanning through it right now. Again, these are items that are provided under attachments in the MLS are part of the purchase offer. Sorry, my computer's catching up with me. How's everybody holding up? You bored? I don't know about bored. A lot of information? That's a lot of information, yeah. So you can practice. Probably make believe, would be wise. Make, make believe you are writing a purchase offer on your own house or a friend's house or a mother's house, a house you're familiar with. Practice, pull a listing out of the MLS and practice. This is a copy of the lead-based paint addendum. This is the one I said, you never ever sign blank for your buyers. We're only talking about buyers. Sellers have to fill this out and it becomes part of the listing, which then becomes part of the purchase offer. Most of the time, what you're gonna see checked is, A, number two, seller has no knowledge, any actual knowledge of any lead-based paint hazards in the house, nor does the seller have any reports of any records of any lead-based paint hazards. Your buyer has to acknowledge that they received information on the previous page, which was the disclosure. As a buyer at the buyer consultation, if you are um, a really good buyer's agent, you have given them the lead-based paint booklet, or what I do is I email it to them, make sure they have a copy of it, and I make a notation in my file that I emailed it to them. Then the buyer has the right, the buyer has to check all three, initial all three. They have the right to make the contract contingent on a lead-based paint risk assessment, or they have the opportunity to do a lead-based paint risk assessment. When it says agent's acknowledgement, that is the listing agent. But as a buyer's agent, you know, you also have to sign this form. So make sure you have that done. All right. I'm going to stop this share and I am going to go, hold on, I start a new share. Don't freak out when you see all this. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. I'm going to open the next one. Here we go. Were you able to access, did, did you get these forms when you registered for this class? They send you a link. Well, if you didn't register, you wouldn't have gotten the forms. But what you can do after you're finished with me is you can email Jeremy or Abby and ask them to send you these forms so you can practice or you can put your notes on them. There. Here we go. This is the Keller Williams checklist. This is actually helpful because number one, it keeps you on track of what you need for the purchase offer. Number two, it's a document that you have to fill out and complete once your purchase offer has been completed. You have to put this information into our system, which is called command, so that you can eventually get paid. That's the good part about this. 
Um, when do you get paid? We get paid about two to three weeks after closing. Our policy at Keller Williams is the day the check comes in from the listing office or from the attorney, the day that we deposit your money into your account. We don't wait for it to clear. We just... I just got to get it in. It is your grandmother. Okay, next. So this is your checklist that you follow. It kind of puts things in order also of what you need. One thing I didn't um, express to you, during the buyer consultation, I do go over more than just the basics. I go over our Keller Williams franchise addendum. I go over agency disclosure with them. I go over fair housing disclosure with them. I go over every single disclosure that we're going to come up with on the purchase offer at my buyer consultation. So that I don't have to explain it all to them when we write the purchase offer. I actually will take a package of all of these disclosures and email it to them so they can read it after our consultation. You don't want anything unfamiliar to them that they're signing, right? How secure would you be? I mean, everybody gets excited. Look, what do I sign? Just sign here. I want you to know what you're signing. So the very first thing this, um, and you obviously should read it also, this Keller Williams franchise disclosure. Number one, they're gonna, we are explaining to them that we are equal opportunity, which is also included in the New York State Fair Housing, that their good faith deposit will be in, go into an escrow account and be held, it's our listing, the buyer's agent will put it into Keller Williams. When you are writing a purchase offer, good faith deposit goes into the listing office's escrow account. On the MLS printout, it states who, what bank is, and who the escrow account is for certain people or certain offices. When you use AuthentiSign, that will automatically populate into the contract. You, there's a lot of information that automatically goes into the contract. As soon as you get a listing and you say, you press a button, it says you're gonna write an offer. All the information from that listing transfers over to the offer. Makes life a little easier. You um, need to discuss with the buyers if they want to purchase a home warranty or not don't have the buyers sign this until they find a house, then they'll know if they want to purchase a home warranty. Our home warranty company, I think is the name of American Shield and it's all in the Keller Williams documents file. I give my copy, my buyers a copy and a link to that warranty company so they can educate themselves. Sellers, this just states that the attorney can pay the commission. You're, oh, this is an old franchise form, so don't use this one. Sorry, we'll have to get a revision on this. But um, new franchise forms, that's for the buyer's email address and phone number. It, uh, there also is an additional form that is attached to your franchise form. It's from Oasis, it's our insurance company. It is a preferred insurance company. Hel all three Keller Williams offices have um, a, a personal percentage of investment in. We have found that our buyers can get great rates, but we have to disclose that Keller Williams has an investment in this company. It's all about disclosures in New York State, guys. I gotta grab water. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Agency disclosure. I go over this very, very thoroughly with the buyers. Very thoroughly. Basically, you have a seller's agent, buyer's agent, dual agent, and a dual agent with designated sales agent. Here you're going to see broker's agent at the top right. It's not around here. It's in New York City, but this is a state form. Seller's agent means you're the listing agent. Buyer's agent means you're acting on behalf of the buyer. Dual agent means you potentially 
have a house listed, buyer calls you on it, you want to see the house. You are now working in the capacity of dual agent. Dual agent with designated sales agent means I have the house listed. In calls, and has a buyer who wants to see it. She writes an offer. We are dual agents because we both work for the same company, Keller Williams, with designated sales agent, meaning I'm the agent of the seller. Dana is the agent of the buyer. When you meet a buyer, you have to print your name, the name of the brokerage. You check buyer as buyer's agent. I also ask for advanced consent for dual agency. See it right here? Yes, no? Yes? Okay. What that means is let's say I'm working with a buyer and all of a sudden I list a house that's going to meet their needs. I haven't asked for advanced consent. Technically, I don't yet. I, I really can't them their house. Also, I ask for advanced consent for dual agency with designated sales agent because I want to show other Keller Williams listings. You see why you need a very good, honest, open communication relationship with your buyer? I think it's important that you explain these things to the buyer ahead of time. I know some agents who absolutely will not work dual agency. I get calls from agents who say, got a buyer for this property. I don't want to be dual agent. Will you take over? So well, yeah, if you pay me, right? Because you're going to have a lot of work. Any questions on this? All right. Fair housing. Make sure you read this carefully. Your buyers and sellers have a right to file a complaint. They feel that they are discriminated against in any way. Most importantly, that they get a copy of this either before they sign it or after so that they always have a way to contact the proper authorities if they feel they have not been treated fairly. I have my buyers sign it as soon as I meet them. Again, remember I said I put together a package and send it to them? Some of these items are signed ahead of time, some are not. The franchise is not, agency is, the New York State Anti-Discrimination Form is. Next form, COVID. Sign it as soon as I meet them. I know the rules changed yesterday, but our phase two, this comes from um, New York State Association of Realtors. We are still following New York State protocol because we have not been directed to follow any different. I ask that when you are showing houses, you explain to your buyers you will be following guidelines of New York State. We can only, as a brokerage, tell you what those guidelines are. We do not offer or give any opinion to our personal thoughts about these guidelines. Can, but I will tell you, I want to make sure everybody is safe as they possibly can be. We did not shut our office down for five months for nothing. We needed to keep people safe. Understandable? Okay. So there's the COVID disclosure. Um, when I list a house, I had one circumstance where... I listed the home and after the appraiser came in, one of the sellers came down with COVID. So I had to do contact tracing back to the appraiser and the buyers were out of town. The buyer's agent had to go over there to do something and we had to cancel an appointment because he couldn't go into the house for so many days. I really think that that was appropriate thing to do. I do not know what the guidelines are now. This was right. Actually, this was last November. Um, but I think it was, I, I actually think it was a very good move that we canceled the appointment on the 
the buyer's agent because it was not an, a good outcome for the seller. Buyer's agency agreement, here's a copy of that contract. If you don't make yourself read this 10 times and become familiar with it, you're never going to be comfortable presenting this to a buyer for their signature. It actually says on here under number six for compensation, no matter what, they're going to pay you. Unless they, if they never buy a house, they're not going to pay you. We work straight commission. But if they go buy a house or someone else, technically they have to pay you. So read that. I'm not here to read all the forms, by the way. Here's a purchase contract. So here's what's going to happen. All of this is going to, the two in the froms are your buyers and sellers. It's going to automatically populate because you put the buyers and sellers in as participants to the contract. There's information that I get from the buyers when I first meet them. I want their emails. I want their phone numbers. I want their current address. I want the best way that they like to communicate by email, by text, or by phone call. I just find it very helpful. If all of a sudden, picture this. You've got 10 transactions going at once. You've got five listings. You've got two buyers, both named Cindy. Are you going to get confused? Is it very important that when you um, write your purchase offer, you pay attention to the dates on the purchase offer? Like, when does my buyer have to have a mortgage buy? When do they have to have the home inspection done? When do they have to have the attorney's approval? You think this is important information? Yes. Because if you miss one of these dates, the contract can die. The seller wants to cancel the contract because your buyer didn't get a mortgage commitment on a certain date. They're just waiting for it to fall apart. That can happen. So it's important for you because your buyers aren't going to be happy with you if you miss a date. They're not paying attention to it. You are. So your buyer and seller will automatically populate. The property address will populate. The county will populate. The town, you have to check one. Is it a town, a city, or a village? It should be a red flag. I better check and make sure it's not in a village. Lot size does not populate. You have to put that in. Description of buildings. Keep in mind that word buildings. I don't care that it's a three bedroom split level. You want to know that it's a single family dwelling with an attached garage and storage shed. They only want to know about the buildings. They don't want to know about anything else. <clears throat> Items included. Read this carefully. Things that people goof up on all the time. Well, three. Swing sets in the backyard that look like um, numbers. They're supposed to stay. Brackets that hold up TVs are supposed to stay. Bug collars and transmitters are supposed to stay. Rule of thumb, anything screwed in stays. That's how I remember. It's screwed in, it stays. Read the private remarks. Most realtors will put in the private remarks a notation anything that is excluded that would normally not be and you have a spot right here you might say the dining room fixture does not remain write it in i then ask the listing agent well what's going to be there are you just going to hang wire are there just going to be wires or what's going to be there so if i put in there dining room fixture does not remain i put seller to cap off electric just to be safe you always check this box Seller shall cause any heating, plumbing, air conditioning, electrical systems, and included appliances to be in working order at the time of closing, except for, you write no exceptions. In my listings, you will see that it says all appliances and as is condition. That better be written somewhere on the contract. Because there's nothing worse than somebody's dryer going two weeks before closing and they have to run out and buy the buyer a new dryer. Questions? No? Yes? Okay. Purchase. This is where you put in the purchase price. Now, there is um, what, there's only so much you can do when you're starting the purchase contract. When you're finalizing the purchase contract in the details section, if you have an escalation clause, 
I put some text right above here that says see escalation clause attached. The escalation clause is an addendum to the purchase price of the contract. In a nutshell states, the buyer is willing to go 2,500 over any other higher offer, including other escalation clauses to a purchase price of 300,000. It's just another addendum. To make sure that the listing agent sees it, I put some text right above the purchase price, which you type in right here. You must fill in the deposit and the deposit cannot be cash. I don't know why it says cash. The buyer shows up at our office with cash. We're gonna send them to the bank to get a check. But they can get a personal check or an official check. You fill in the deposit amount right here. Seller concession, we almost don't have to talk about in this market. If you have a buyer that needs a seller to help with closing costs, this is where you disclose the amount, either as a percentage or as a dollar amount. The balance of the purchase price is either in the form of cash or a mortgage at closing. This is your job. Buyer has delivered or will delivered within two calendar days of acceptance, deposits set forth in the contract at. This is, or it will be held in escrow by, so let's say it's our listing, it would be held in escrow by Keller Williams Realty. It would be deposited at Lions National Bank. On your MLS printout, it will state who the, and the, it's kind of in the bottom left-hand quadrant of your printout. It will state the escrow company, maybe it's Remax Plus, that will be held at ESNL. Or Howard Hanna's is at m and I just happen to know that because I write contracts on their listings. Our escrow company is Lions National Bank. Seller concessions are taken care of at closing. They only can be for lender approved costs. Any transfer tax, recording costs, mortgage, all these are adjusted at closing. I do want to bring up to you. The house is on propane or oil for fuel for heat or anything. The buyer has to reimburse the seller at closing whatever is left in the propane tank or oil tank. Just how it is. So if your buyer's tight on cash, you might want to put in the purchase offer that the buyer is only to reimburse the seller up to $200 based on reading that is in the tank before closing. So if you're doing a walkthrough before closing, you're going to make sure that you've got an invoice that someone's come out and measured how much oil or propane is left in the tank. And you want to inform your buyer that they have to hook up with an oil or propane company or they will have no oil or propane. Contingencies, lots of contingencies. Look at this. A through, mm -mm -mm -mm. hold on. A lot of things could be contingencies. Subject to getting a mortgage is the contingency. Because the buyer has to get a mortgage or they can't get a loan. They can't buy the house. So you have to check the box. The contract is subject to buyer obtaining a, and accepting. Let me tell you what that means. The buyer will get a copy of the mortgage commitment. It's your responsibility to follow up and make sure they sign it and send it back to the bank. They have to accept that mortgage commitment. But some of them, them obtaining and accepting a written, what type of mortgage? How are you going to know? On the prequal letter. So a written conventional mortgage, not to exceed, this is a percentage. How much are they putting down? Are they a 20% down buyer? Are they a 5% down buyer? So if they are a 20% down buyer, the mortgage amount is not to exceed 80% of the purchase price, right? 20% down plus 80 is 100% of the purchase price. An interest rate not to exceed. How are you going to know what that is? Prequal letter. If it's not in the prequal letter, you call the loan officer. You get a little feel. Never put on what the rates are that day. 
if the rates that day are 3.5, I ask my buyers, if the rates go up to 3.75, do you want the house? Yeah. Go up to 3.875, do you want the house? Yeah. If go up to four, you want the house? No. What do I fill in? 3.875. It's the interest rate for a term of 30 years. Buyers shall immediately apply for this loan and have until you should give them about 30 days to get a mortgage because it's not just getting a mortgage. The appraiser has to go out there. The appraiser has to evaluate the house and send the paperwork back to the bank saying that the house is worth what the buyer is paying for. So you need about 30 days. This little um, dollar sign in here, you fill in based on what repairs you think the bank may request. So you have some homework to do. I want you to Google common FHA or VA repairs. Let's say you know that there's some broken steps or missing handrail. You know that FHA is going to cite that. So you're going to want the seller to be aware that the bank may cite repairs. You fill in an amount. You guess. You just guess. You can Google, you know, how much does it cost to fix this one cement step? Use your better judgment. Cash transactions. Oh, so you put this date in here that the buyer's gonna have a mortgage by. Weeks after they go to the bank, you make sure the appraiser's out. Three weeks later, I'm calling and making sure that the appraisal's back. And four days before that commitment's due, I am asking if they have a written commitment. Make sure they have it done in time. Once they have it done and they've signed it, you have the responsibility to send out a removal of contingency to your buyers, removing the fact that they have a mortgage. That's your job. Anybody think they'd have this much to do with the purchase offer? Nathan, you're the only one unmuted, so I'm going to pick on you. Um, you know, I knew it was, yeah, unfortunately, I had a lot better grasp when I was just finishing the real estate you course. And, you know, it's funny how you become overconfident, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not overconfident, but, you know, I think I was just talking to somebody how we, you know, we can make this happen. No problem. You know, and, and it's funny, it, it, there's a lot to it. I, I mean, I think that you, you called it right with the idea that, you know, you just muscle memory, you've got to just, you know, you've, you've got to learn it, you know, and, uh, yeah. I don't know how else to say it, but it is, it's an intricate process. I mean, it really is. I, I can't imagine one would get it right on the first try. I, I don't, um, I, you know, without, without the help of someone, I, I just don't see that happening. But um, we tend to be very, very cautious and take our business very seriously. That's why we want you to have a mentor sure. to review this and to really help you make money. Because if you goof up, if you're, you know, I can tell you my last listing, I had 18 offers. Out of 18 offers, there were probably 10 that were well-written. There were some that it was subject to a mortgage and nothing was filled in. Like, how much mortgage are they going for? There was one that they checked a property inspection and there was no property inspection addendum. You know, how I, secure, you know what I, I mean? Like, how secure was I that this is how it starts? How's it going to go? You know, it's interesting you say that because my mother is planning on selling her house, you know, and uh, it's a, a little more, it's like people just want to hear it's easy sometimes. And, you know, it's, you, I think you were calling it out how there's a balance between rapport, maintaining rapport without overwhelming, you know what I mean? And then also getting the information across. Uh, I, I've, had, I've had challenges with that in sales myself. Um, and uh, it is it is an intricate process. There's no doubt about it. You know, I think if you ask the questions, you don't want your buyers to know every little step of the way what you have to do, but you need to make it perfectly clear that they have to cooperate with you because there is a lot to do. When you call them and say, did you get your mortgage payment? Oh, I haven't looked at my emails. Please look at your emails because you have to sign it, date it, send it back, and I have to remove that contingency. I'm saying it very forceful to you in a little bit different tone of voice than I would with my buyers. But I am one too who follows up with my buyers by email. So I, because like I said, if I have 11 contracts going, I can't remember who I talked to and I have that conversation with them or was it at the 
was it at the consultation or, you know, did I call them about their commitment? So it's really great that I can follow up with an email or a text and say, hey, I do need that commitment. We have until this day, you know, they could cancel the contract. If they're not cooperating, you're going to know right off the bat. Like if all of a sudden they say, oh, it's two days. Can I bring the check tomorrow? No. No. We need it today. So it's up to you to, to do this and make sure that it's done. A lot of agents tell me I'm a pain, like if I'm the listing agent, because if I don't get a phone call on my listing from the appraiser within two weeks, I'm calling the buyer's agent and say, hey, I haven't heard from the appraiser. What's going on? Oh, let me check on it. Then they don't call me for two days. My next is an email. Did your buyer even go to the bank yet? Like I'm getting nervous. Yeah, sounds sounds uh, interesting. You gotta sure. follow up. It's okay to follow up. You probably are going to say, "I am never going to show Karen's listing. She's going to be a royal pain." Well, honestly, that. I would be eager to work with uh, to watch you for a week or so because uh, I. Because I mean, you have muscle memory with the way that you. I mean, it's like you you are you are real as good as towel. You you do you live this for 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 years and years, and um and it's it's awesome. I think it's awesome myself, because if you, uh, if you get yourself on a checklist, honestly, doesn't matter if you remember or not. Now, if you ever want to take off for the weekend or take off for two weeks, those checklists you hand over to somebody and say, "Here you go, this is where I'm at." Yeah. You never know if you're going to have an emergency. So sure. live by your checklist, write down your steps. You are going to be so comfortable your, with yourselves if you write down your steps. Yeah, I have a question about that. So when you have, you know, when you get started and you eventually have tons and tons of buyers and sellers, and do you have any tips for like keeping everything organized, like remembering where you are with which buyer? Like, do you keep track of things on like an Excel sheet or how do you do it? Okay, guys. I still do everything by paper. Okay. So this is kind of what, what, like, what my day might look like. Can you see this? Yes. This says everything from... Check on the mortgage commitment for Tom and Kaylee. Make sure Gail's offer to deposit is in. Make sure I signed up for the golf tournament. Um, get the offer for Gene and Jack. Make sure the attorney's approvals are in. Um, listing appointment next week. Prepare. Listing appointment this afternoon. What time I need to be there. Little notes about it. And listing appointment later tonight. It's on Friday. I have certain things I do on certain days of the week. So if my day on Tuesday is to check on mortgage commitments, that's what I do. It's all about, and the thing is, every single contract is different. So the minute I get a contract accepted, I take that contract and transfer it to my calendar. So if my mortgage commitment is due May 25th, the first thing I do is I go May 12th and write down, make sure that the appraiser is out. A week later, make sure all the documentation is in and we're near commitment day. Make sure, make sure. So I just keep track of every single client that way, Alicia. It's the only way to do it. Some of the agents are really great um, with the Excel sheet. But for me, if I'm driving in the car and I think of something, I want this thing next to me. I don't want to have to open up or I don't want to have to put a note in my phone. This is like, this is, this is, if I lost this, I would be in real big trouble. I mean, I don't know what I would do. So I have a small whiteboard at home too that I use. That is a really great idea because then you've got the picture all in front yeah. of you. Right, Nancy? Yeah. I've got one for like active, active buyers and then one mm -hmm. for the, like the B, C and D people. So nobody gets through the cracks. Once you want to contact maybe once a week and say, hey, yep. guess what? Nothing new came up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still here. Hello. Yep. I have not forgotten about you. Mm -hmm. So you do want to keep track. It's very, very important. But 
you actually follow the purchase offer, you can, and this is what I do. I look at the purchase offer and I film the dates in on my calendar. Okay, they have to have a mortgage commitment by this date. They have to have their good faith deposit by this date. They have to have their attorney approval by this date. It's so easy if you just follow the calendar. I know, Nathan, it sounds like it's all memory. It's all following my forms. Mm. I really, I really pay a lot of attention to that listing and purchase offer checklist because that keeps me straight. I think the deposit's in, is the deposit in, is the deposit in. You know, I, you got a lot going. You sell two or three houses in one week. You're really going to go nuts. Okay. If it is a cash transaction, I, if your buyers come to you and they say cash, I pull out my contract and I say, you need to understand that the contracts now say that if it is a cash transaction, the buyer has to immediately provide proof of funds in U.S. currency, immediately available U.S. funds. Guess what? A 401k is not immediately available U.S. funds. I thought it was. It's not. I lost an offer that way. People were using their 401k. Of course, they didn't want to take their money out before they needed it. Got to pay all the taxes. <laughs> Got to pay the taxes. Right. Penalties. Um, another one that my buyer you was know, from I, one, we, we We were going around this on the team. And although it's not immediately available, but one way to kind of, I used to sell securities. Yep. One way to kind of get through without taking it out because some people are taking it out for cash and then they're going to refine, put the money back in within the 60 days is if they even sell their position like within five days of contract acceptance and they show that the money's in a cash position that might go better with the listing agent because you can get cash out easier. If you've got to sell the securities, it takes a couple of days for this, the trade to settle and then you can request the money. Plus this way you actually preserve the price that it's at the value that it's at now. Cause we were talking about this on the team and said, okay, great. You've got $350,000 today. If the market tanks in four days, you've got 250. Whereas right. at least if it's in a, in a cash position, it's just something to keep in mind. It's, you know, it, it it's helps. A good idea. It helps because it's, yeah. it's that much closer to being readily available. It still takes a little bit of time, but at least, you know, the market's fluctuation, you're not going to have to play with that. You know, I've had some of my people call their financial planner. Even if their money isn't a 401k, I get a letter from their financial planner. It yeah. Said they have this much available funds to um, be immediately available. Yeah. They'll just write a letter on the letterhead and that's all you need. Yeah. You know, most of my people who are cash, they're not clearing out their 401k completely. Yeah. The first thing I'll money. say is, so it's the penalty on this sucker. Yeah, I know that's terrible. It's like you want to make sure they understand there's a penalty and they're not going to be backing out. I do have to say something else. When there is a purchase offer and it's all cash, get a, make sure your buyer puts a huge good faith deposit down. Because what is the skin in the game if you write an offer for $300,000 and they put a $2,000 deposit, they change their mind a week before closing going to walk away from 2000 I had this conversation with one of my buyers last week yeah. while I was away. He it the still was a $100,000 property, but he wanted to put 2000 down. Nope. And I kept telling him and he went up to 3500 and thought it was a big deal. And I said, no, nope. you're not, you're not going to get this. His proof of funds was over 200. So there was no problem. Um, he didn't get it. And he kind of argued with me a little bit about, well, if everybody if everybody's offer was similar and we were all escalating the same, why didn't they come back to me? I said, because of your deposit. I said, 3,500 might seem like a ton of money to you. I said, but for most people in the scheme of things, if something goes wrong and they change their mind, they'll walk. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I think he finally, you know, had another come to Jesus with him because I've had to do this a few times, but it's like that deposit is going to get you nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. Yep. And it didn't. It so, didn't. That was one of the reasons he didn't get it. They they don't listen to you until they lose a few times. It's not that you want to be right. It's just these are the facts. Yes, I do. 
premium mortgage has this, what they call cash guarantee, where the buyer can go in and do some extra verifications, like here's my bank account, here's my tax returns, here's my pay stubs, blah, blah, blah. And premium mortgage will write a cash guarantee, meaning we guarantee that we will give these people a mortgage subject to the appraisal. One interesting fact on this is premium mortgage requires that the buyers put a good faith deposit down of 20% of the purchase price. I didn't know that until I got an offer on one of my listings last week. Oh yeah, it's a big deposit. And I said, why is this deposit like $48,000? They go, it's the criteria of the bank. I go, oh, what a smart bank. Of course, I loved that agent because how likely is that buyer going to be to walk away from that deposit? Or not. Not. But if a, if a, it's a 400 house and they have two grand or three, they, they don't like it, walk. Not fun. Anyways, additional financing terms. Um, sometimes people are taking a home equity loan out of their house or something. Just don't know. Could be anything. Sale and transfer of title. Please make no, do not do this without help. First couple times you do this. Because if your buyer is subject to the sale and transfer of title of their existing home, the dates have to coordinate. How much time are you giving your, your buyer to sell their existing home? What, what are the mortgage dates and what are the closing dates? They have to coordinate. And what do I put in that sale and transfer of title addendum? And Karen is really good at this because one of the first deals I did at KW had a bump clause oh, yeah. and I was petrified and she walked me through the whole thing. Just saying. Yeah. So what that means is when your buyer puts an offer in and their house isn't sold, there's a bump clause in it, which means another buyer can come right behind them and put an offer in and bump your buyer out because their house isn't sold. We like that? No, we don't like to do it to people. Most buyers are non-contingent right now because they don't stand a chance writing an offer contingent. That's why there's so much of a housing shortage. The buyer, the people who sold their house, my daughter being one of them, has no place to live after June 30th because I can't find her a house. Not living here. Anyways, um, you know, it's it's kind of thing like she could not an offer in on a house because he had to sell her house. There was no chance of her getting a house. So she's had to sell her house and now take the risk of being homeless until she finds something. Which she knew that ahead of time. Inspection of property. This contract is subject to inspections. Now, letter B and letter C have separate addendums, which you're going to see under number 26 of the purchase offer need to fill, be filled out go along with these contingencies of the contract. Building code compliance. This is when we talk about permits and certificates of compliance. There's really two steps to this. A buyer wants to put it or a homeowner wants to put a deck on. They go and they get a permit. What they're supposed to do after the deck is done is call the town and say, okay, my deck's done. Come out and make sure it's okay. Nine out of 10 towns never come back and do that. But when they come back and do it and deem it appropriate, that's called a certificate of compliance. Most agents are not checking letter D because it's too hard to get this information from the town. It was impossible last year with COVID, but it still is a little tricky to try to get this information because it says that they have to have it to the buyer within 10 days. I don't know a town anywhere that is getting this information to the seller within 10 days. Other contingencies can be anything. Maybe your buyer just wants to see a permit for an in-ground pool, or you can write in their seller to provide permits only on file with the town at this time. Every contract is subject to attorney's approval. This is not a line that you can leave blank. It will be subject to your attorney's approval within three days. Please read the rest of that paragraph because if one attorney changes something, the other attorney gets three days to agree to it and blah, 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 blah. Condition of property, we went over. This is where they're referring to the property condition disclosure statement. 
Has the seller provided it? And if they have, your buyer has to read it and sign it. If the seller has not provided it, they will credit the buyer 500 or it is not applicable. Does everybody remember going over that earlier? Yes. All right. A representation. The buyer has to sign the, the purchase offer stating it's owner occupied if they are buying it as an owner occupied property. If they're buying it as, as an investment, you don't check 5 1. Excuse me, 5 B 1. I check both these boxes if it's an owner occupied scenario. Number two says the seller to the, their knowledge represents to the buyer that as of the date of acceptance of the contract, there's no liens against the property. We're gonna be starting to come up against this because with deferred mortgages because of COVID, people are gonna start getting liens thrown on their property. So we better be pretty aware if there's any liens. And I don't know how we're gonna be because we're not a title company and we don't pull an asterisk right away. But you know, sometimes you can look on the tax record and maybe see if taxes are paid or if a lien has been thrown on the property. Certificate of occupancy, really this applies for rentals. If you're selling a rental property or a new construction, you wanna make sure there's a recent C of O on the property. For certain towns in the city, C of O's are all you at different times, some let you transfer title and they're good for four years, some you need a new CFO every time you transfer title. Letter D, zoning. Property zoned as A. If it's a single family dwelling, right? Single family dwelling. If it's a two family dwelling, two family dwelling. If it's a five unit, it's zoned as a five unit dwelling. Very simple. Condition of the property. Buyer is purchasing the property as is, except for provided in paragraph 1B. 1B basically states that everything is in good working order and they are purchasing a property subject to normal wear and tear. You don't expect to go in and um, find holes in the wall. But if the carpet was soiled when you looked at the house, there might be a few more stains on the carpet. Subject to normal wear and tear. Um, letter F, if there are any gas, mineral, timber rights that the seller owns and are presently attached to the property, it will transfer to the new buyer. Pay attention to letter G for services. No, this is when you have that second opportunity to talk to the buyer if there's fuel oil. You need to explain to the buyer that they're going to reimburse the seller the cost of whatever is left in those tanks. Is it natural gas? Is it propane? Is it public sewers, public water? Is it a septic or well? If it is a septic or well, you need to know from the buyer's lender if they require a septic inspection or a well inspection. I personally struggle with any buyer who waives a well or septic inspection, but again, in this market, we're seeing some crazy stuff. Crazy. When you do a well and septic inspection on that addendum, anywhere it says the word recommended, I cross it off because I want that well or septic to follow the guidelines of the addendum. I don't want a piece of paper that says septic pump all good. No, it's not good enough. It's not an inspection. Closing date. Oh, propane. Your seller has to disclose if they own or rent the propane tank. If they own it, it's going to transfer with the property. If they rent the propane tank, the buyer has to make arrangements with whatever propane company they want to use to get that tank up and running in their name. Most buyers just keep the tank that's there. Then they're tied to using propane from that particular company who owns the tank. They buy their own tank, they can use whoever they want. Closing date. You just fill in the county that the, the property's in. So if it's Monroe, you fill in Monroe County, Livingston, Ontario, Wayne, whatever county. On or before, remember this is a target. 
So if it's a cash deal, it's usually about 40 to 45 days for a closing. If it is a regular mortgage, I mean, agents are writing 45 days and they're closing in 50 or 60 days. I usually ask the listing agent, what would be ideal for your sellers? I also ask the listing agent to make my offer more powerful. How would your sellers like two or three days to stay in the house after closing to make their move simple? And I bring this up to my buyer, like, hey, give them a couple days free rent. Make it appealing for the, for the sellers to take their time moving out. What if they can't get them over that day? What if, what if? It's conversations. So that's when you get into possession that the buyer, whoa, hold on. The buyer will have possession of the property at closing or, hold on, or the seller has the right to retain possession. That's when I say, give them the house for a couple of days free or the buyer wants prepossession. I don't know many buyers who want prepossession, but if they do, good luck with it. Because most attorneys and most sellers will not let the buyers move in before closing. I don't know how else to put it. Even if the closing is delayed at no fault to the buyers, mm -hmm. most attorneys will say, sorry, not going to let you move in. Title matters. This is when we get into the attorneys. I want you to please, please, please read this so you're familiar with the words. But don't advise your buyers about this because this is attorney matters. The title, the survey, any liens, any judgments, any back taxes, any boundary line agreements, all up to the attorneys. If there's any objections, let the attorneys work it out. That's what they get paid for. Letter 8A, you just make the check mark, but your name and your real estate company will fill, be filled in automatically. Letter C states very clearly that anybody who's going to buy this house has to sign the contract. And sign it later. Sign it now. Notices. Again, this is all the attorney. Right up to letter E. Any notices have to be in writing. Nothing verbal stands. If the listing agent says, oh, the neighbor lets everybody drive on their property to get to the pond. Uh-uh. Nothing like that stands. Electronic signatures will be accepted as letter F. Addenda. All these addenda are in this package. I am going to explain them quickly to you because we're kind of running out of time. I guess I just talked too slow today. Addenda, agricultural disclosure. Usually in the listing under attachments, if it is in an ag, well, if it is in an agricultural district, the addendum will be there for your buyers to sign. If you are showing property and next door is a cornfield or cows, it is an ag district and for your buyer's sake, you have them sign an agricultural disclosure. All parties agreement. This is only for FHA and VA. It is a separate addendum to the contract. It states that if the house does not appraise out for purchase price, the buyer doesn't have to buy it, nor does the seller have to reduce their price. This is becoming really touchy with these multiple offers. Next one, contingency addendum. This is, I think it's a one page, it might be two pages now, form that's put out by the real estate board with almost every kind of contingency you can possibly imagine. Things like, is the property in a flood zone? It's part of your investigating, by the way, when you are researching a property for a buyer, go in real estate and check the flood map. Make sure it's not in a flood zone. It can be horribly expensive. But so for your contingency agenda, it might say um, seller to provide buyer private drive agreement and homeowners association agreement to take care of road. Buyer is cash buyer, but they still want an appraisal done on the house. Um, buyer to provide documentation of replacement of septic. It could be any contingency under the sun. You'll see it on the forms. It'll give you a lot of ideas. Electric availability. 
So let's go back, jump up to ag district. Your ag district, your electric availability, your uncapped natural gas well, which is over here, the far right on the top, and your utility surcharges are all on one page addendum. All different things, but they just use that one page. Electric availability is used for lots. That means that there's electric at the road. A home warranty, you may want to check it if your buyer wants a home warranty, but put under other, the buyer is paying for the home warranty. Lead compliance is the form that we reviewed. Again, any home built before 1978 needs this addendum. Personal property agreement is also a separate addendum. We put it on a separate addendum purposely because then it means that the appliances are in as is condition, differing from what's stated under the no exception paragraph on page one of the contract. Property inspection, again, is a separate addendum. Rented property is a separate addendum. This is a two page addendum. If you are selling a multifamily, this is a great form because it will actually be under attachment in a state. How much is the rent? How much is the security deposit? How long are the leases? Do the tenants own the appliances? It states everything on there. So the seller can't lie to the buyer. They, oh yeah, I own all the refrigerators and all the windows and all the washers and dryers and the tents move out and everything's gone. Thanks. Sale and transfer of title. This is when the seller has to sell their house. Sometimes the contract is subject to short sale approval. You will find that on the contingency addendum. Short sale means that the seller owes more than what the property is listed for. So the seller can accept the contract, but then it has to go to the seller's lender. The seller's lender has to approve the contract. Cap natural gas well. Find this in rural areas. Basically, what this means is someone has gone on the property and drilled for natural gas and may not have capped it off. Never, ever, ever walk rural property alone. We don't want to find you at the bottom of a gas well. Utility surcharges, that could mean that they came down the street and put sewers in when there was were all subjects. Maybe everybody on that street has to pay a little fee or a large fee every year. It has to be disclosed. Wayne County, any home in Wayne County that is sold has its own separate addendum. It's because of Ghanaian nuclear plant. There's just something that says gases and odors. So any property, listing or sold. Your well and septic addendum is attached again if there is a well or septic. You want the seller, I always ask the seller to provide it. I don't think, I think there's a huge liability if a buyer hires someone to come on a seller's property and something happens, like the bulldozer falls in a septic tank, that's not good. So talk to your mentors about that. Then you have your buyer sign the contract. You, uh oh, fill in life of offer. Number nine, if there's other terms like an escalation clause or anything else, this is where you have the opportunity to write that in. Make sure you make your offer good through the time frame that the uh, seller's agent is requesting. If your buyer is declining a home inspection, you have to check the box that says they're declining. And there is also a Keller Williams form waiver has to be signed by the buyer separate to declining just to the purchase offer. Here is information you have to fill in about your buyer. This is when it's very helpful for you to do your homework. Make sure once you know your buyer's attorney, you know their address, their phone number, and their email so you can fill it all in to be prepared. This is what an escalation clause looks like. Basically, it says that your buyer is willing to pay a certain amount of money over any other higher competing offers. Do final purchase price of. I do have another clause in here. It's called right of first refusal. During the attorney approval period, if your buyer gets an offer accepted, the seller's agent has a responsibility to notify the sellers if another offer comes in, even after your offer is accepted. The seller's attorney has not approved the contract. 
your buyer could be bumped out. This clause gives your buyer the right to have the right of first refusal if that happens. This is just a continuation to the contract if you have to do any additions or subtractions, changes. This is the addendum for the, some of the contingencies that I talked about. There's private road, water access, cash for an appraisal. If the seller's financing, let's read it, see what applies. This is the um, addendum for electric, utility, gas well, and ag disclosure. Your buyer has to sign it. It applies. This is the addendum. It's called an all parties agreement for FHA and VA. This is where you fill in right here that the house has to appraise out for the purchase price. You don't write purchase price. You have to write a dollar amount. Then the bottom the bottom quarter of this form is for VA. The top is for FHA. The bottom is for VA. Here's your personal property agreement. You see very clearly that it says in their present condition, differing from all in good working order as per the contract. So when I'm at, I'm on the buyer's end, I put the I put the personal property, the contract to make sure they're working. But if I'm the listing end, I want it on a separate addendum to protect my seller. See how you change hats? So oh, property inspection. You check what they want in the normal time frame. Is the property inspection is to be done within seven calendar days. The buyer then has three calendar days after the completion of the inspection to notify the seller if they want any repairs. The seller then has three days to fill in these days. So it's 733. Get back to the buyer if they are willing to do these repairs or not. Here's the inspection waiver Keller Williams requires if your buyer waives their inspections. This is the rented property addendum. It is two page for a reason because your buyer will have the right to review leases if they wish. The second page should be under the attachments in the MLS so that you have all of this information, the tenant's names, if they have any advanced rents, if it's a written or, or oral lease, it's month to month. All of that is on there. Really kind of great form. Here's the transfer of title where it says it's subject to the sale and transfer of your buyer's property located at no later than. So then you have to disclose where your buyer's sale and transfer contingency, have they sold their house? They've sold their house. What contingencies are still in effect? If your buyer has an all cash offer and it's close to closing, I cross this out, try to cross it out and squeeze it on through, hoping the buy or the seller's agent allows it where my buyer does not get bumped out of the house. You have to protect your buyers and your sellers so they could get bumped. Then this tells you when your buyer is allowed to remove their contingency and when they do, they can remove it before their house transfer titles. Here's the notification, the disclosure for Wayne County. You will see this under attachments. It should be there before you write the offer. Here's the addendum for well and septic. So you check that you want potability, which means it's drinkable, and volume, which means the well replenishes itself. If the property has a well, you only need this. And if the property has a septic, you need this. If there's no septic or well, you don't need this addendum. This is normally completed. You can put anywhere in here between 20 and 30 calendar days of the acceptance of contracts at the seller's expense. Then the seller has to get the, it to the buyer within three calendar days after the completion, and then the buyer has three days to get back to the seller stating that it's acceptable.
Remember I said I cross up the word recommendations all over this thing? You can also write in here or wherever you can fit it. I usually type right in here, all following guidelines to be completed for testing. That way, when it says recommended, it just negates recommended, meaning um, you want the guidelines followed for testing of water, meaning nitrates, nitrites, any kind of organism. Some people want to test their well water for radon. It gets pretty crazy. If you start getting into these rural areas, your mentor may or may not have a lot of experience with wells and septics. And if they do not, make sure that you know, you get the answers that you're comfortable with. You can call me. I am not a well or septic expert, but I can just tell you how to fill out the forms properly. So remember when I said that you have a lot of responsibility removing contingencies? Look at some of the contingencies you have to remove. Look at them all. Ah. You have to remove if they do a chimney inspection, once they've reviewed a condo homeowner documents, if they've done an engineer inspection, if they've initialed that it is not in a flood zone and it's been verified, if they've done a radon inspection, if they approve of the rent and lease agreements. All of these, this is a very handy form just to keep, just to keep in your checklist so you know you don't miss anything. If your buyer is getting a grant, you have to disclose that too. It's not just getting a mortgage, it's getting a grant also. This form is used if your buyer buys a house, but it's subject to the sellers finding suitable property. Your buyers really don't know if they bought a house to begin with, because if the sellers don't find something, the whole thing dies. It's up to you if that is in a contract to make sure the sellers do at some point remove that contingency. Um, if you feel you are in a situation that your offer wasn't presented, you can put this form to the listing agent. I'm going to preface this with something. This is one of the stupidest forms NYSAR ever filled out or complete. The thing is, if you feel your offer wasn't presented, the concern you have is with the listing agent, right? Like, did the listing agent really present my offer? Why is it they need it, the listing agent to sign? If you feel uncomfortable with the listing agent, they're going to lie to you that they presented their offer, your offer. So I, if I feel I have to use this, I'm crossing this line up. It says listing broker, listing agent. And I'm either going to make sure the, the office broker signs it or the seller sign it. How would you feel as a buyer that a month later, you know, or, or even like the listing agent starts talking to you and you just can't believe your offer was accepted? You don't do this as a standard rule of thumb. You just, if you get uncomfortable and feel like your offer wasn't presented, then you use this. These are what we don't like to see because after you've gone through all these forms and you've presented your offer and now all of a sudden your buyer loses their job two weeks before closing, it's up to you to do more work and get a cancellation of contracts so that they can get their deposit back. Now, some buyers think that they're not, no one's going to know if they lost their job two weeks before closing. Bank has a right to call the employer and pull another credit check up to 24 hours before closing. And I can tell you this, I was signing these forms left and right during COVID because all but a lot of buyers were losing their jobs. The bank, we couldn't even get a hold of employers to verify if they were still working. So it's pretty crazy. So that's a form you don't want to have to fill out, but you have to know that you do if you feel called for. Here is the COVID questionnaire. This is the health screening questionnaire. Um, I honestly don't know as of yesterday if we still have to do this, but I'm guessing to be prudent, you might want to. There is also a COVID mandatory NYSAR 
form that was further in the contract. But I don't know if we have to still do this health screening or travel advisory questionnaire. I know we don't have to do the travel advisory, but no, I don't know about the health screening. Hey, that's everything. What are your questions? So the, the COVID form, okay, you have them sign that prior to showing them a property. Am I correct? Yes. Um, I either ask them at the house or I ask them, I, I sometimes I email it because sometimes a signature is requested, but most agents are pretty um, lenient on this. Like I'll write right on this form that I verbally ask them because they okay. didn't sign it. So are you saying that you have to, when you submit your offer, show that when you showed the house, you had them fill this form out. Are you just saying you have to have them fill it? You follow? Yeah, I, uh, there's two COVID forms. This is the health screening. I keep this on file. We don't necessarily have to have this. We were using this for contact tracing. So oh. let's, let's say that you showed my listing. I call you and I say, Nathan, we have a problem. My seller has COVID or I've been notified that the buyer that came through the house before you has COVID, how you filled out a health screening form where your people okay, but I need to notify you. Okay. It's not a phone call to make to people. Oh. No, it doesn't sound like it. But there's also a COVID form way up in this package that you do include in the purchase offer. I don't know where it is. Okay, so there is a COVID is. form in the purchase offer itself. Yep, here's okay. the COVID form that's in the purchase offer. It's page seven of 36 pages. The other one is the health screening that you just keep on file. Okay. I'm sure there's going to be more questions. If you want to yeah. take down my phone number, sure. tell me when you're ready. Yeah, that would be great. It's Two five nine seven five three two. Call Nancy Rogers. Still answer your questions. Two five nine seven five nine two. Seven five three two. Seven five three two. Okay. All right. Yeah. I hope to see everybody on this class again in about three weeks. No, no, I don't do it every three weeks. No, Next this is month. a two-part series though, right? It's a two-part? Actually, this is um, this is a two-part series. Kaylee Moody teaches fire series part one. That's the um, one I was referring to earlier. Oh, all right, I'm in buyer series part two, aren't I? You're Where in you buyer mean? series part two. Okay, cool. I didn't, okay. So I've got to still take number one. Sounds good. You, you're going to see it on a recording. We only do these classes like once a month. So oh, we okay. do recommend to buy the newer agents. That yeah. They look at past recordings too, because I always say different things and Kaylee always says different things and I might miss something. It used to be an all day class. Right. We like did practice it just got to be like you guys newer agents had deer in the headlights after two hours and we realized that just wasn't working so it's just yeah. too much information right yeah that would be true buyer series okay um so i, I gotta take the seller series at some point too and that'll be with you and her or not me not with you nope. okay there is a whole different person who does the listing in okay you might well, see me pop on those classes too. Sometimes I hop on for a little while just now, for a quick. Where can, I, where can I see the uh, reserve of videos you're talking about? If I wanted to access the, would um, the video I would, referring to? If I were you, I would reach out to Chris Whitus at the office. She takes care of all the videos. To my knowledge, they are under the KW in the no file so this is on that connect command right you go to connect command okay yeah don't yeah. ask me how to get there because i'm not going to tell you how to do it wrong okay so somewhere on command i, you, I bet you I'll can be also get, if you go ahead if you don't have that stuff on command yet too you can just go to youtube and google or you know search 
Keller Williams um, mm. instructional videos or Ignite, and that they'll all come. You'll get on the Keller Williams um, Brighton page, and you'll find you can find all the videos there too. If you have a hard time finding it through Connect or Command, okay. I just put the, all, link, the link to the YouTube channel it. in the chat. Okay. Well, it got really quiet. We good? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your time. You're welcome, guys. Good luck. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.